Uh, so my name is Anna Hammais. Uh, I'm a data architect here in Turku University Hospital in Finland and our uh, data, data cl clinical informatics unit is called Aurea Clinical Informatics. Um, let's see. I have a more a general part of the slideshow to begin with to tell you a little bit about uh, Finnish healthcare system and the FinOMOP collaboration and the centers that are included. And then in the later part of the slideshow, I will tell you a bit more concretely about our mapping work. So uh, for those of you who are not Finnish, most of you, uh, just briefly, uh, Finland has at the moment approximately 300 municipalities and they are in charge of providing primary health care to citizens. And then above that, we have another level called hospital districts and there are 20 of those across all of Finland and they provide a specialist medical care. And I work in the hospital district of southwest Finland and let's see if I'm able to use the pointer possibly here in Turku. This is where I work. And out of the 20 hospital districts, five of them are a university hospital districts, meaning their universal hospital exists in that district. And Turku is one of those five, and you can see the other ones in the map image. And uh, university hospitals provide highly specialized medical care. There are even such uh, treatments that are only provided in one of the university hospitals. So it's it works quite well that way. Um, this system is supplemented by private health care and occupational health care as well. But uh, I will now mainly focus on uh, experience from uh, university hospitals because that's what our Finn OMOP network consists of at the moment. Of course, we hope to get some primary healthcare providers also involved in the future. And uh, I believe you will receive these slides later, so you can follow the link if you wish to know more about Finnish healthcare system. And then uh, something about us, the Finn OMOP collaboration. That's what we call ourselves. Uh, this means simply the OMOP uh, enthusiast centers in Finland and everyone is free to join when they wish to start converting their data to OMOP. And uh, our collaboration was established in 2020. And uh, our member organizations at the moment are four out of the five university hospitals that you saw on the map, always yet to join, but we always keep inviting them to our meetings. I'm sure they will eventually hop on the OMOP wagon. And also the, uh, our partner that's not, not a university hospital is THL, which is the Finnish abbreviation for the National Institute for Health and Welfare. And uh, where we started, it was in Tampere University Hospital. They were uh, Eden Data Partners since the pilot call, so they were the first in Finland. And my hospital district in Turku University Hospital started in, in the third call and Helsinki fourth call and I believe Kuopio and THL are probably applying or have just applied. I'm not exactly sure of their status at the moment, but uh, we have this network of data partners in Finland at the moment. And on the right side of the screen, you can see our SMEs that we have been collaborating with we have three SMEs in Finland, which is quite nice and uh, really highly qualified ones, having experience of them. And uh, the way the Fin OMOP partnership works is that we have two monthly meeting series. We have a higher level one where we discuss the general guidelines and research objectives, objectives and such. Uh, and then we have a more technical one. So we have a slightly different group of people participating in those two. And then the technical group always uh, informs the higher level group of what's going on and where we are and what's the status. And I hope Kimmo doesn't mind. I'm mentioning Professor Kimmo Porkka from Helsinki University Hospital here as, as a sort of leading Finnomop contact. He's, he's 
very much part of the higher level group, <laughs> whereas I'm more part of the technical group myself. And then a little bit about my unit, Aurea Clinical Informatics here in Turku University Hospital. I have to advertise Turku University Hospital, the oldest hospital in Finland. Long history. <clears throat> there was a slight gap between the founding of the hospital and starting of clinical data lake operations, which happened in 2014. That's when I started working at Aurea Clinical Informatics. We have an in-house on-premise data lake, which means it's not in a cloud. It's it's actually very close to us here in Turku. Our IT service provider is hosting it. Let me see if I can show you to MIT for hosting our data lake. And the current staff at Aurea Clinical Informatics uh, is 14. We have a few data architects like myself. We have data analysts, uh, system specialists, maintaining servers and services and biostatisticians. We also offer statistical service to our customers. And uh, we are working very closely with Aurea Biobank, as you could probably tell by the name. Aurea Biobank is the first Finnish biobank. It was established in 2012. Since then, there have been several more. And our website link is also there. You can go and check it out when you get the slides. OK, maybe jumping a little bit into the technical. Technical side of our OMO project. We have been. Uh, working on this Eden Data Partner project all of 2021. We started very early in 2021 and we're now writing our final report. So we are sort of we've sort of passed the whole path of the data partner project. And uh, I will tell you a little bit about the tools we've been using. They may be very familiar to you if you're if you've worked with OMOP for a long time, but. I've marked the important ones once highlighted in orange, so. As I said, we are not even in the cloud, so everything we do happens inside hospital firewalls, so data security should be fine. It's as good as hospital data security is, which kind of makes me feel quite safe. And we are very strongly utilizing the open source tools that are offered by the OTC community. Uh, ones you probably know of, White Rabbit and Rabbit in a Hat, those were the ones we started with, so we profiled our data with White Rabbit and did our ETL design with Rabbit in a Hat. That was a very good way to communicate to the ETL developers what we wanted done. And in our database, we have a PostgreSQL engine and we've written our ETL scripts in PostgreSQL scripting. And then we use uh, Pentaho data integration for ETL orchestration. That's a tool we're accustomed to using for ETL. And uh, the R programming language is very familiar to us to begin with. That's what we use to do all of our data work from the data lake. So it was really nice that it's heavily used also in OMOP. And as for data quality tools, those were, I think, what we found most useful in OMOP, in all of the Odyssey tools. So uh, Achilles, Achilles heel, a data quality dashboard and the CDM inspection report. We we love them basically. Of course, they give us a lot of gray hairs because they tell us there are errors in our data, but they are errors that would have been quite difficult for us to find without these tools. So I'm really happy and I would recommend to everyone who's doing this to start running them as soon as you have any kind of data in your CDM. They will give you a lot of valuable insights. I have taken a screen capture of the data quality dashboard. I would have liked us to have been at 100%, but you can't complain about 99. I think what our current problem still is that we have some plausibility errors. So some of our lab value ranges are not plausible according to OMOP, OMOP guidelines. We are looking into that at the moment. I suspect we will find errors 
maybe even in some of the OMOP value ranges, but probably in our own as well. Or perhaps it's mapping errors. Anyway, a very useful tool to, to have shown us this. But 99, I think that's quite good. Um, can, I ask, can I ask you a yes. question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. This is this is awesome. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll keep this one brief. Uh, let me switch to my webcam. Yeah, it, it's great that you are using the, uh, the DQD dashboard, and and I agree there may actually be also some errors in the definitions of the values in the uh, in the tests. Um, so do share that with us. Uh, I know Claire Blackater who built the package is one of the my PhD students. Uh, she would be very eager to learn from you and maybe even have a session with you to go through your data quality dashboard and provide some feedback uh, if you want to. I think it's interesting for us to improve it further and, and figure out whether those, especially those measurements ranges, those are quite tricky uh, and maybe different also across the globe and we may have to adjust those. So yeah, we will see it when you submit the report, but if you need some earlier interactions, just, just reach out. Thank you. Yes, I think we've been suspecting that uh, some part of the, the errors that are only slightly outside the plausible range might be due to our hospital because we are specialist medical care. We treat patients who are slightly sicker, if you could say that. So yeah. some, some, but some values are clearly such that maybe 40% of our data is outside plausible ranges. So there must be some kind of error and it's very interesting. We will make a log of everything and See yeah, and get. I think in the end, uh, you may want to try to get to 100%, but I think already understanding why you are not at 100% is just as valuable, right? So you can accept some of these changes because you know why, and you can even adjust the thresholds in the DQD uh, if you want to uh, yeah, want to get to 100% anyway. But it's it's that insight that's the most important thing, I think. Yes, thank you. Um, then I think the next tool on the list is Atlas which I'm unfortunately not an expert in. Uh, I hope that our analysts will grow to love Atlas, but I've tried it so far and it seems like it's a, a massive toolkit to do all sorts of things. Something that I wish we'd had earlier in our own original data model, but now, I'm, now we're lucky to be part of this, this community to be able to use it. And, um, then I have to mention GitLab. We are using Git as version control and we have a shared GitLab uh, server uh, to share with uh, everyone in the network. So in the FinOMOP network, we have a repository where we, where we save our scripts and reports and of course the mappings that we, that we do nationally. I will tell you a bit more about the GitLab in the coming slides. Okay, now I will tell you about something that I feel we're very lucky to have in Finland. Uh, THL are governing our, all of our Finnish medical vocabularies. So we don't have to worry about what are the official codes to use for these things in Finland. We can just go to the THL code server and find them there. And the code server is used to distribute uh, medical vocabularies to all patient information systems in Finland. So the information systems are always up to date and using the right vocabulary terms. And uh, THL has the groups, groups of uh, subject matter experts that are maintaining these vocabularies. So they really know what they're doing and they know what new codes need to be added. And all of us, we can just benefit from that. So if somebody wants to take a look, there are links. And THL, of course, is the national authority on health matters. Of course, they're quite busy with, with the pandemic at the moment. They are, they are the uh, authority that's working, working on that as well, giving guidelines and everything. But the code, code server is a very, very valuable resource to us. There's, a, there's an image that I took quite quickly that shows ICD-10 codes and their names in, in different languages. This is from the code server. Just have a little drink, excuse me.
Okay, I have listed some of the vocabularies, maybe all. I'm not sure if something is missing, but these are the ones I could remember us having worked on in the OMOP project. <clears throat> There's ICD-10, which is luckily very international. And it's uh, very well mapped to SNOMED and everything in, in OMOP already. The trick with us was that we are using a Finnish version of ICD-10, which contains some codes that are not in the international versions. For example, we have combination codes like this example here that combines a cause and symptom into one code. It's basically two codes combined and this concept means something a little bit different. And as I recall, we have also some slightly more specific codes for cancer in our Finnish ICD-10 codes that include histology information as well. This is apparently not in the international version. So we had some mapping to do, even though the, the ICD-10 is very, very well mapped already. And then we had the procedure coding system from Nomesco. I think it's used in the Nordics, not only in Finland. Um, but we weren't aware of a translation that had been done from this, a mapping that had been done from this to OMOP. So we just started working on it. This is what the codes look like. There's the body part in the beginning and then the type of the type of procedure in the end. Oh, sorry. Uh, then, then we have the lab test classification. It's a national Finnish coding system. It basically tells us the system and the analytes. So if you look at the examples, the BHB means hemoglobin from blood and P means plasma. So this, this kind of codes express our lab information. We didn't necessarily know a whole lot more about these tests other than the system and the analyte. Uh, so our mappers had to dig up some stuff from lab uh, operation manuals and things, but they found it very interesting and I think they progressed very well. Uh, then a slightly smaller vocabulary is a classification of medical specialties. Quite important to know if a diagnosis was made by a, a let's say pulmonologist or a or hematologist or a psychiatrist. It might mean something. And uh, then there's the lab measurement units. We don't have any codes for these. It's just these phrases that that say grams per liter or such. Most of them were quite easy. Some of them were very strange, but I think we we got to a fairly high coverage in our mapping. And then maybe the trickiest one was our pathology data, which kind of loosely follows SNOMED 2, which is a very old version of SNOMED from the 80s, I think. And what that does is it expresses pathological findings by combining the topography, which means the organ type or the tissue type, and the morphology, which means the finding, the cell type finding. So basically our codes in this case were combinations of two kinds of codes. So the T-SNOMED, the topography and the morphology. This was, this was difficult, especially since the book, I think the book from the 80s that was used in my hospital pathology lab, it's a paper book and we couldn't find a, an electric one and I think the paper book even was followed slightly. Um, well, modifications were made to the original codes. So this this was a bit trickier. I can show you in the next slide why it turned out to be trickier than I thought in the beginning. Uh, what's left? We have drugs where we have the ATC codes, which is apparently quite international and the OMOP uh, already has mappings from ATC to RX norm, which is the standard. So we didn't actually have to do very much. That was that was a relief. And then there were names of microbes, microbe findings. Hmm? Yes. Sorry, 
Uh, sorry, I, yeah. I, I'm, a question about the about the drug. So you don't have information about like the strength, the number of milligrams, and the route. Well, the route maybe truly ATC a little bit, but uh, sometimes it's quite useful to have that information. It must be somewhere in Finland, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Let me think. Uh, routes. I remember seeing the ETL person just. I think he did the mapping as he went. There were maybe 10 or so different routes of administration. So we don't have an actual mapping for that, except in the ETL code. Okay. Uh, let's see, strengths. I don't know, are, are you? do you mean that there should be a mapping for that? I mean, we do have those well, in the data. They are yeah. not always as structured as I would like. Sometimes we have a free text field where the doctors just typed something that the patient can understand, but it's not really machine readable very well. Right. Yeah. So ideally, of course, you have both the form, so it's a tablet or it's something else, uh, and the strength and the ingredient. Ingredient. So those three components together would actually define what a clinical drug level in Rx norm. So it gives you just more detail and it would allow mm -hmm. you to do other types of study than just the ATC code. The ATC code is actually a classification system, which is, well, we use it a lot in Europe, but I don't think it's the, the best way to do drug research. You, you definitely need to have information about strength, um, dosage uh, in many, many type of questions. So if you have that information, it would be good to, to help you think about how you can better map that. Uh, and then ATC code is actually a level on top of that that you can still use, uh, but uh, I, would, I would go for the more granular approach if possible. Okay, that's that's valuable information to me. I wasn't aware that Rx norm is like more specific or more granular. Yeah, I have to look into this a bit more. Sure. I, Not only that, but it is more often used in the other uh, with the other centers and other data partners. So uh, that's the gold standard to go to Rx norm. Okay, that's good information. Thank you. I have heard, uh, I think our head pharmacist in the hospital pharmacy once years ago criticized a ATC coding to me saying that, uh, for example, ibuprofen might have six different ATC codes. So if you know somebody's received ibuprofen, you don't know which of the six different ATC codes is relevant there because it also depends on the on the purpose. Why are they yes. receiving it? Is it for pain? Is it for inflammation? Is it for something completely different? As so the acronym that's... already says, anatomic therapeutic chemical. So um, it has different representations of the same substance depending on the therapy. Yes, that's true. Okay, so I'll be learning more about Rx norm right after this. Sure. Um, Names of microbes. Hmm? Sorry. Reach out to that to us. Yes. For more information. Thank you. Names of microbes. Also, there's a list of a national list of microbe names, but there are no codes. So we just basically took the name and mapped in in Usagi, which was fairly easy because the names are like Latin, so it's easy to find a match. So that was much simpler and, of course, not a very long list. Uh, as for our data, this is a quite busy table from early 21 when I was writing my work plan, our work plan for this Eden project. Uh, I calculated how many patients and how many rows of data we have in each source table and what vocabulary is used and how many distinct codes there are in that vocabulary in our data. And then I was interested to know, to estimate the amount of work we would have in the mapping. So I calculated how many codes we would have to map per vocabulary to get to 90% coverage of the data rows. And now I'm wiser. I've noticed that Achilles uh, likes 95% coverage. So if I had known that, I would have calculated 95%, but I didn't know at the time. So my numbers are for 90% of data coverage. And I think the most important thing you see from this table is you don't really have to map that many distinct codes to get a very high coverage in your data. For example, the labs, they were very satisfying because we have 130 million rows of data 
4,000 distinct codes, but you have to map only 130 to get to 90% coverage. That's because the most common lab tests are really common. Whenever something's wrong with the person, you take the basic blood tests and you measure the basic things, like hemoglobin is part of the basic panel. So this was really nice. It was a positive surprise that we that we can get that far by mapping only quite few codes. Uh, what we prioritized, we thought was very important, was of course diagnosis codes and labs and procedures. Those were like the ones we wanted to start with. Maybe we left the pathology a bit later. And the pathology was the biggest surprise to me because I hadn't quite understood everything to begin with. And I calculated that we had 5,000 different codes. That's calculating the T SNOMED and the M SNOMED codes together, just summing them together. But then I realized the patholo pathology observation is actually just a combination of those two. So we actually had 30,000 different combinations. So we, we should have mapped 30,000 codes, which is quite a lot. And we did start the work and for some of it, we the ones that we haven't been able to map yet in pairs, we have mapped only based on the morphology code. So if a patient has carcinoma, it's it's more useful information than uh, say a patient has something wrong with their skin. So, so morphology tells you a bit more than the topography if you have to use it alone. But of course we are slowly progressing to, to map the pairs and get the information as specific as possible. So this is, this was a lot of work coordinating all of this and well, most of you know, most of you have done this kind of thing. But also very important, very interesting. And we had specific personnel to do the mapping work. So they, they, they found it very interesting. And then when they were a little bit tired of doing diagnoses, they could switch to procedures and labs, and then it would be quite a different world for them. So they seem to enjoy the work. And uh, the previous table was from my hospital. And since we're talking about a national collaboration, uh, we have to think about which vocabularies are used in what way in each hospital. Uh, what we found was that ICD-10 and the procedure codes are used very coherently. If we use a specific ICD-10 code, of course, it means the same thing as when Helsinki or Tampere uses that code. Uh, and the same with procedures. But lab tests were a little trickier. I have uh, an example here highlighted in orange where there's the same code used in two different hospitals and it means a very different thing. And this is because the national code range is between 1000 and about 7500. And as you can see, this number 158, that's outside the national range. So uh, the way I understand it is that lab tests develop very quickly. New needs come up all the time and tests are taken into use. And then the national governance sort of follows a bit behind. They have their experts who decide what codes are created in the next version and so on. So hospitals are able to create their own temporary codes if they're below 1000 and above 7500. So here we had to be a little bit careful. Uh, if 158 in my hospital means cow dandruff, it means crystals in a bursa fluid in, in Tampere. So I don't know if I said that right in English. You might know what is bursa fluid, but it's not cow dandruff for sure. So we had to uh, make sure we distinguish these by calling them in different vocabularies. They are not part of the national one. They are local ones. This helped us get past that problem. And like I said, SNOMED 2 was quite tricky. Uh, there was often a tendency in many hospitals to use a more generic code 
and attach a more specific explanation to it. And the way I see it, a code should always have the same explanation, but our data didn't agree. So there was some of our mappings are probably a little bit less specific than they could be. For example, inflammation M40,000. It could be it actually meant inflammation in appendix. So that's why it's important to map the, both the codes as a pair and not just inflammation here. It's actually quite quite interesting, intriguing that you found out through this project that different hospitals are using different codes. Right? So <clears throat> this actually shows why it's so important to collaborate, and this is really really nice. It would allow you to do so much more work for the hospitals if you try to fix this problem. Yes, and we felt it was important to distribute all of these. Uh, different mappings even though this specific code isn't used in my hospital but it may be that a similar test is done in my hospital anyway i may benefit from this mapping if i don't look at the number but maybe i look at the, at the abbreviation or the name i have a couple of slides very just in case somebody is just starting on their omop journey a uh, link to Athena, which is the vocabulary resource online. You can just go to the website and spend days or weeks there learning about things, search on words and see what kind of concepts come up and especially what kind of relationships between concepts there are. This is, I believe, essentially the same information that you get when you download uh, the vocabularies from Athena to your own uh, common data model to the concept table and concept relationship table. This is just a much easier and more visual way of, of using this. Of course, if you love SQL, you can use the database that you have. But for us normal people, this is, this is a nice way to look at the vocabularies. And then another quick picture of Usagi, which is the main mapping tool that you use when you're doing the mappings. I have only tested Usagi. I haven't done any heavy mapping work. We had separate people for that, but they complimented Usagi, said it was very easy to use and very nice, especially because it uh, automatically tries to map the terms by a similar text that it finds, which was very helpful. But there's links you. so you can go and look Did at you them yourself. Time? Hmm? Did, you first trans did you first translate everything to English? I actually have a slide where I explain this slightly. Yes, that's that's the go-to way of doing this. If your data is not in English, if your uh, well, your codes can be whatever, but if your explanation or description columns not in English, you should try to make it in English by Google Translate or whatever means you have. Then Usagi is going to be able to estimate what would be a suitable match for your term. Uh, we had a lot of our codes, thanks to THL who maintained the vocabularies, we had a lot of the codes explained in actually several languages, but I will come to that I think in a few slides, show you an example. Um, I wrote an outline of approximate steps that we took for the national mapping collaboration. First, of course, we figured out what vocabularies are shared. Are we the only ones using this or is this national? And are they harmonious or are there differences? And then has something already been mapped? When I came to this project, something had already been mapped because of Tampere, who started in the pilot call. So uh, the next step was to find out what had been mapped what was already there to work with, uh, combine everything into one, see if there were overlapping mappings, same thing mapped by several people, and then prioritize which mapping you want to choose. And then after that, there's still going to be codes that you need to map. Everything isn't done yet. So you gather the codes that still need to be mapped and assign work to the mappers that you have available. And then always start with the most frequently used codes first, because that way the data coverage is 
gets higher quicker. If you map codes that have been used once in 2005, that's not very useful work. But if you map something that's used 3 million times a year, that's useful. And then um, create some kind of process for adding new mappings to the master file and reviewing the mappings. If you have a clinician who specializes in this exact field where the codes are from, then it's really useful to have them review and see if they agree. And then there's point six, which we haven't done yet. I think this might be useful, is to create a concept ID for our local codes so that we can use the local codes as well in Atlas to search. This, we're not very far in this yet. We've just been thinking about it and it sounds useful, but also I would like to hear comments on whether this is useful or if it's done in other centers. Okay, when we started work in early 21, it's the Turku project started then, there was already uh, one summer's worth of mapping done in Tampere the previous year. And we had those mapping files available in the source to concept map format. And Helsinki had done some reviewing and some additional mapping. Uh, which we had available in different kinds of Excel format. So what I did was to combine those files using R and I, I created one file per source vocabulary uh, containing the mappings that, that had been done. I call that the master mapping file. I will probably use the word master. So it means the best possible mapping per source vocabulary that we have. And uh, what I did was I prioritized the Helsinki mappings because I knew that they'd been done by a clinical expert. So I trusted them over the original ones. And uh, what kind of skills we needed to do this collaboration process. Um, it would be preferable to have someone who's kind of handy with data and IT in each hospital. It's not necessary, but it would be preferable. And we luckily we did, so that was useful. Uh, lots of mappers, anyone you can find to do mapping work, just recruit them. And then uh, somebody who's sort of centrally in charge of, of gathering uh, different files, coordinating the process, advising others what to do. That was my role, so. I was kind of a linchpin. And then uh, later on, you need preferably clinicians to review the mappings in their own specialty. Uh, but basically, not everybody working on this needs to be a technical person at all. Um, and now here's uh, an example image of, of the GitLab version control repository that, that we have. We have a specific server where we run GitLab and we are in charge of granting access rights to specific people who are involved in this project. Uh, the bare basics uh, I'm showing here is we have a done folder where all of the master mapping files go and we have a to do folder where we put the lists of codes that have not been mapped yet, but would be nice if somebody could map them. And uh, a version control is a system that's very widely used in programming and it keeps track of changes made to files. So it keeps track of every tiny change, which is really useful if suddenly your file is empty. When there used to be a thousand rows, you don't need to panic. You can just back up to the previous version and everything's safe. And uh, then we had subfolders for, for each, each vocabulary. Also in the GitLab, we, we have meeting notes and all sorts of other materials, but the master mappings are the main, most important thing. Was there a question? Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I really like that you are going for this more like collaborative effort in, in mapping. I think you definitely need that. You need that to scale up. Um, I just want to briefly mention that we have been thinking about this also in Eden, how to do that with Git and how to separate the work or distribute the work across a team and then get some 
way of harmonizing those differences and getting like version control on the releases of those mappings. And so it would definitely be good to have a, not in this call, but a separate session, maybe with Maxime, who's been extending Usagi, he's the one who's maintaining Usagi, who's extending Usagi with these options that you can actually see there already, who is owning which, uh, which row in the mapping table. Um, one thing maybe just briefly to, to point out here is that I would advise you to make separate gits per vocabulary. And, and why am I saying that? Uh, because you will have releases. At some point you are done and you want to release a mapping. And I think, well, git is, and we use GitHub, but it's very comparable to GitLab. Uh, you want to be able to have versions on the mapping releases. And you don't want to have a mapping release for all the vocabularies at once in Finland, but you want them individual, right? Because one may change, the other may not, and it's much easier to track those. Um, so we, we've created a kind of process for that that uh, we're quite happy to share with you. And I also like to learn from your completely independent development of this idea. I think it would be good to learn, uh, learn from you as well. And probably we can optimize our procedure based on your, your lessons learned, but this is, uh, I think a very important development and we need to work on this together and find some common framework using Git uh, to have others use it well and, and make a very nice collaborative effort. I mean, it's impossible for any single organization to maintain all the European vocabularies and it, it, it really needs to, this type of community efforts. And so thanks for sharing this and we'll definitely follow up on this specific point. Yes, thank you for that hint. That was actually very useful. I I am not so experienced in Git that I would have figured that out myself, but I do do uh, no releases, and I think that's that's a very good good thing to do. We will we will do that definitely. Uh, let's see. I think I covered everything in this slide. Uh, this is the the busy. These following slides are slightly busy and technical and very concrete. So let's see how fast I can go through them. Um, but the heading says everything. So gather existing mappings and combine into master files and one master file per source vocabulary. And we keep the different dialects in the same master file. Uh, we just append the name of the hospital to the name of the vocabulary so that we have one vocabulary per dialect, basically, if there are dialects for this, this vocabulary. And what we do, not necessarily what you should do, but what we do is we keep the master file in the source to concept map format and we get this by exporting from Usagi. You might also version control the Usagi mapping file format itself. That's perfectly fine and probably better in some cases. We had some trouble with our people who weren't all very IT oriented. If they opened an Usagi mapping file in Excel and did stuff, then Usagi wasn't very happy to read it back in again. So we figured it might be safer if we keep everything in the source to concept map format. It's easy to read. It doesn't have too many columns. Easy to edit with Excel without breaking it because it doesn't need to be read into anywhere other than the database. But you know, we would avoid problems if we accidentally changed date formats or something. It wouldn't be so bad. Um, and this uh, file, yeah. Yes. It's, it's nice to see that actually in the table you are already using some of the new features. <laughs> so you have the, you have the mapped by and the row updates information there. So this is some of the newly added stuff. From, yeah. From yeah, I figured Great, it so would be useful to to if you don't have to necessarily go ask Git who did this. You can see it yeah. from here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And also we figured it would be easier this source to concept map format would be easy for clinicians to review. They don't have Usagi, they don't need to get Usagi. They can just have Excel, which they all have. And then the additional columns at the end to help us a little bit. And a magical row ID in the beginning, which I will explain in the next slide, because we didn't originally have a row ID. Um, uh, why we added it was to be able to maintain the order of rows in the mapping master mapping file. As you can see here, Git is quite useful. It tells you, okay, this row has been deleted in the new version. There's nothing here. This row is different in the new version. It's shown in green. 
Uh, if our rows were not in order by row ID, uh, this is what it would look like. I have a file where I just changed the order of the rows. I didn't actually change anything about the content, just the order. And Git thinks, oh, everything's different. There's nothing the same. Okay, one row is the same, but everything else is different. When actually nothing is different. So that's why we created the row ID and we strive to keep it in in the same order all the time, ordered by row ID. So that way it's easy to see what's changed. This is, a it, of course, it requires you to remember to, to sort it every time you want to push, but so far we've managed to do that. And then after having created the master files, uh, we had a lot of mappers hired for the summer and we needed to give them work. So we made a to-do file for each vocabulary. Uh, what you need at least is your code and vocabulary name and some sort of description, preferably English if you have it. And then uh, it's useful to have the frequency of the code. So you can see here in the table, some codes are minus one means unknown frequency. And uh, 20,000 or 19,000 is something you might want to map first out of this bunch because it's the most common. And then there's an assigned to column just like in Usagi. Usagi also lets you assign work to people. It has a very handy feature for that. And uh, what other useful columns you might want to include, you can include. Usagi can read them all in when you tell it to. For example, for lab tests, you might want unit of measurement. The mapper might want to know if it's grams per liter or, or uh, I'm not good with labs, but anyway, you can imagine it helps them understand what's going on. And then explanations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, THL uh, offers always Finnish explanations, uh, almost always Swedish explanations as well, because that's the other official language in Finland, and sometimes English explanations. But we found Swedish quite lovely. It was very close to English. Finnish is not anywhere near close to English. As you can see from the cow dandruff example, this is lehmä, this is cow in Finnish. Ku in Swedish means the same thing as cow. So they're much closer to each other. So if you have a language resembling English, it's much better to use than some esoteric language like Finnish. But I've heard very good examples of people using Google Translate and getting their, their explanations to English. So that's probably a good way to go. Maybe uh, something to add there as well. So uh, yep. we learned actually recently that there is a European um, service being set up where you can uh, also do translations. Uh, so it is something that uh, I like to look into a bit more because that's actually free uh, and should be at the same level as the uh, commercial uh, solutions there because sometimes they have a maximum number of rows and then you have to start paying or it's, it's difficult. Um, so something to keep an eye on. Uh, this might be an interesting solution. You can they have an API, so you can even automate that through that European translation services from the European uh, Commission. Wow, that sounds really useful. Yep. Yes. Yeah. One one other comment about your yep. uh, the issue did that did you have with the ordering? There's some good suggestions already in the chat as well on how to solve that. And another thing that we noticed and you may experience at some point is that it sometimes depends on which operating system you are. If you commit to Git and especially to GitLab, how it deals with like the end of line characters and so that there are some fixes that you may have to make if someone's working on a Mac and then pushing to uh, the, the the central uh, GitHub. So uh, if you ever experience that, just uh, rip us a line. Yeah, so. yeah, I think we've had Windows, mostly Windows users and some Linux users, probably no Mac yeah. users so far in our collaboration, but it's inevitable that it will happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> OK, then assigning this slide doesn't give that much more compared to the previous one, but I'm just, I have marked Tux there in the assigned to column to mean that my hospital is planning to map those rows. So when you push this file to GitLab with your assignments, it makes everyone 
tells everyone that you are working on those rows. Others should not touch those rows because that it would be overlapping work. And this worked quite well. We were doing mappings in three hospitals at the same time, and we were able to sort of control that no overlapping work would be done. And then after the mappings have been done, or some part of it, 200 rows or 500 rows or whatever, we export it in source to concept map format and just appended our rows to the master file and filled in the columns that needed to be filled in manually. And then it's very easy for hospitals when they want the new, the new mapping file or the latest additions, they just pull from the GitLab repository and get the new file into the ETL process. Uh, as for reviewing, we haven't done that in, on, on a large scale yet, but we are planning to. And our mappers are not in the audience, I hope, but for any mappers, reviewing does not mean we don't trust you mappers. We do. But uh, it's always different if you have, let's say, a young medical student doing mappings, or even I've done a few rows of mappings. It's much nicer to have an actual clinician who knows the, the content very well, uh, the meanings of everything. So clinicians will start doing reviews. Uh, we have a lot of clinician contacts in our hospital, for example. So we're planning to give them just a few rows each so that they won't feel overburdened. And uh, what, 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 used, what used to work quite well with this is that you first do a couple of sessions where you try to get people aligned a little bit between the reviewers. At least that was my experience. If you just give maybe all of the reviewers in a, in a training session uh, 100 codes and then see what happens. And that, that solves a lot of pain later. Right? Yeah, yeah, we need to have uh, uh, maybe a smallish group of clinicians who are actually well versed in the OMOP world. And then they can easily explain it to new clinicians speaking the same right. language. Like, what is this? What's the point? What's important? That's that's the plan. Luckily, we have. Clinicians already Sorry. are part. We have clinicians already part of part of the phenomop, so no problem there. Great. Yes. One thing that we we also had uh, have explored recently is adding like a column to express whether you had to map up or down or, or how certain you are, and that's that's based on the fire definitions of uh, these mapping levels. Uh, yes. So that's something to maybe review in a later stage. I find it quite interesting to do that, and you can also see maybe later if new codes come up, if you can still go to a better level and review those, um, yeah, if there's a change in the vocabulary. Yes, yes, that's true, and Usagi has that. I think you can tag whether this is an exact match or a more you know, general term, like you have a very specific lung cancer, you just map to lung disease if you can't find a better match. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can add a comment as well. There in Exactly. Yeah, that's that's very useful. Then those rows you can easily check later in bulk to see if if there are better options, like you said. Yeah. Um, so what we have at the moment is exemplified here in Excel. So reviewer, review status and grade. Grade is something like good means I'm happy with it. Nobody needs to think about this further. Reasonable means I'm kind of OK with it not the best, but we could maybe change these in the way that you suggest. The reasonable could be sort of this is a little bit higher level or something. We'll think about it. This is very much work in progress planning this. And uh, some rows here say under review means that uh, me, I should be reviewing this row next. It means it hasn't been reviewed yet. Luckily, I don't review them. I just give that up work to people who are better equipped. OK, and then. Hmm, after you've mapped everything. I say now the fun begins, but mapping was fun too. Don't get me wrong, but the, the researchers think the fun begins now. So if you've done your mapping, you are at 99% in data quality dashboard you can actually start doing something interesting. So 
What we want to do first is, of course, assess the validity of the map data. Uh, can we run analyses in Atlas or scripts that we've written ourselves or Hades analysis scripts? Can we get something reasonable out of it? We have people uh, planning simple analyses, uh, ready to inspect the results. They know what results to expect. If our results are not like that, they're going to be like, eh, something's wrong. So we have we have lots of plans to start assessing whether we've done well or not. This is in addition to the reviewing of the mappings themselves. And uh, we're planning pilot projects, at least hematology and urology pilot projects are, are in the making. It's really interesting to be able to do nationally and then if that works out well, then internationally as well. And of course, we want to inform clinicians in our hospitals that this is available now. Come join us, come test it out, plan your analyses. We uh, haven't been able to advertise very much yet because it's been ongoing work, but now we're finally able to. And of course, the grand goal is to join international research efforts when we're confident that our national data is, is high enough level. And then I have a brief slide about the centers and the people involved. This is just the core people. I hope I didn't forget any core people. Um, we have double or triple the amount of people sometimes present in our meetings, but it's been really fun working with everybody and the collaboration. It's not always easy. We're a small country, but it's not always easy to organize this kind of collaboration uh, out of the blue, but this group has worked really well. And then there's my contacts at the end. You will receive the slides and you can you can email me if you have any questions or comments or anything else you'd like to say. Thank you. <laughs>